y'all so we made it back here from mexico and i don't know if y'all know this but it's freezing outside what does y'all do we did not come back from our marriage conference cruise to expect all this cold weather but since it's here i do want you to know that we are back we are excited about worship to, um, this sunday and looking forward to what the lord is going to do so i just wanted to give you a couple of quick announcements to just let you know what's going on welcome to west side thank you so much um, for joining with us this coming Sunday. And so we're looking forward to an awesome time with the Lord. But don't forget, right around the corner, on February the 25th, comes our 75th church anniversary. That's right, 75th church anniversary. Um, I don't know why I'm looking like a Jedi right now, but our 75th church anniversary is coming up on Sunday, February the 25th. We're looking forward to a great time together in God's house. Special guest, Dr. Perry Hancock, is going to be with us from the Louisiana Baptist Children's Home. It's going to be awesome. It really will be. We're looking forward to that. But as you know, part of the uh, festivities of that day is that we're going to be having a uh, potluck dinner on the grounds right after church. And so hopefully you'll be able to bring enough for you and uh, a family as well. And so this gives an opportunity to gather together to fellowship. It'll be a great time. And not only that, but uh, that Saturday before, um, our students are going to be having an awesome uh, steak dinner. Unfortunately, they have sold out. That's right. Uh, there are no more spots available. And so the students have done a great job. And thank you for those of you who have supported them uh, as they get ready for summer camp and just looking forward to that exciting time together in the Lord's house. And then this coming Sunday, Sunday, February the 18th, we will have a business meeting at 316 uh, p.m. there in the fellowship hall. So if you can kind of put that on your radar for uh, this Sunday, February the 18th. 2024 business meeting. I know you're excited about that, uh, but it's always a great time as we just discuss and um, look over all that the Lord is doing on a very practical basis. This morning, we are thankful for all of you who have returned from the cruise. We know that y'all are ex excited and glad to be back on firm land. And in the same way, our, our Lord Jesus Christ is our firm foundation. And so we're going to worship him singing that song. If you would stand with us at this time. Okay. The rain. 
was built on you. Come on. And I'm safe with you. I'm going to make it through. Sing that again. The rain came, the wind blew, but my house was built on you. And I'm safe with you. I'm going to make it through. Repeat that. Yeah. Thank you for joining us this morning at Westside Emmanuel Baptist Church. Hey, push that little button, uh, Sylvia, the G, and then that'll take that off for a moment. We are so excited that you are here. We are excited that we are back. If someone next to you in the middle of this time looks as though they have a tan at some point in time, they were part of this marriage cruise, all right? And so the rest of y'all who had to suffer the joy, including Brother Reuben, he got a little tan as well. And so... Uh, so we are just thankful. I mean, we, we had a great time, but we are so glad to be back with you this morning. Uh, if you were here last week, let me tell you, um, I received a picture. I am so proud of y'all. Y'all, 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 y'all made it through last week, and so I appreciate the ministry and, and leadership of all those that were here uh, leading us during that time of worship. Just a great time. But this morning, as we celebrate all that the Lord is doing, would you take a moment? Would you find somebody next to you? Would you shake their hand, hug their neck? Welcome to West Side this morning. We are so glad that you're here. Amen. Good to see you in God's house. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, when everything around me is shaking, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Oh 
How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living hope Who could imagine so great a mercy What heart could fathom such boundless grace
church sing it dismissed for children's church just stay right here bobby stay right there for a moment as our band comes down our uh, our panel comes up there's somewhere around here we're going to dismiss for children's church as sylvia comes to uh, to lead us in this part uh if your child wants to leave for children's church we invite you to do that for a moment but you know this past week we've talked about god's faithfulness and so for some folks these songs kind of hit a little bit harder because they began to think about god's goodness and the hope that we have in christ and so um, so for a moment, would you uh, just sing that chorus for a second as they come and sing that again? Sylvia, why don't you lead us in that? All my life you've been so faithful, all my life. You guys can be seated as well. Come on and sit down with us. All my life you have been faithful. Come on, church, y'all sing that together. All my life. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Amen. Thank you so much. Yeah, you can keep that. I won't need that. Um, look, this morning, if you turn your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and so here in a moment, I'm going to uh, allow these folks. To, oh, Sylvia, I know what I needed you for. Every one of these folks needs a microphone, so I know. 
that's part of the intern part is that you just um, you do as the, uh, the pastor. Not your daddy. That, that ain't my fault. The pastor messed that one up and stuff. And so just get these folks a microphone. Um, but, you know, as we gather together this morning, 1 Corinthians 13, uh, these are some of the folks that, that went on our uh, marriage cruise. And some of y'all are like, well, they just go cruise and it's just the love boat. That's all they do out there. We actually do have times of worship and Bible study and the songs that we sang this morning were songs that we sang this past week. And so, uh, so if you're interested, you'll receive more information in May about next year's marriage conference cruise. And, and I hope that'll be a blessing to you. But I want you to turn your attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 for a moment. As you turn there... Coming up Saturday, uh, this coming Saturday, the youth will be having a steak dinner. Um, I know that we are currently sold out, right, Brother Drake? And so, um, so thank you for your support of our teenagers. Uh, we have like uh, 250 steaks. 300. All right, we moved to 300 steaks and all that they'll be preparing, and uh, we'll have a great time there. One of the things, the events of, um, of this coming Saturday, is that we're going to have a, a love and marriage show. Um, here, here, for example, are some of the questions, and we won't have anything like that this morning. Um, but some of the questions are, you know, who is the better cook in your family? Um, who, who is it that hogs all of the blankets in your family, one, one or the other? Um, who is more likely to cry during a movie? And so some of y'all uh, may, may know exactly. So we'll have some of those questions involved in the Love and Marriage show. But we did have a Love and Marriage show this past week on the cruise. Those of you who went last year, and, and you've been to other ones, um, you may remember some of the folks that go up on stage and how exciting and awesome that is. Well, well our very own, Jane and Jimmy, went on the, um, they were part of the marriage, I mean, yeah. Clap your hands, don't watch the footage, but... Um, but some of the great stuff that they were asked, they were asked questions like, you know, when and where did you meet? Oh, well, that's a pretty good question. Or how about a question like this? Or, um, you know, rate your first kiss. All right. And so that, that was one of the questions. Um, some scored higher than others. Uh, they had a bunch of other stuff, right? A bunch of other stuff that they had during these uh, questions. But, but in the middle of this love and marriage show, what they were trying to do was define what is, what is love. All right. What is love? Baby, don't. Okay, exactly. All right, so I figured, I figured my boy would know that. All right, but, but what is love? And, and so when they were trying to describe and define love, one of the things that they, they missed out on is the biblical idea of what love is. Now, you can't see it through them, um, but love in the Bible has a couple of different words. All right, so we know love. I love my dog. I love my wife. I love my critters. I love to go hunting, um, you know, all that. I, I, I love multimeters. I'm not sure what that is, you know. There's a, we learned this past week that there's a thing called a fluke, a fluke multimeter. And so if you've ever, you know, some of y'all are like, I know what that is and stuff. Um, but what we had talked about this past week was this idea of love. And so we, we understand that the Bible uses four different words for love. One of those words is a word called phileo, the city of brotherly love. Anybody know where that is? Philadelphia. It's the city of brotherly love. And so it's phileo. It's this idea of friendship love. There's another word for love, which is storge, and that's the idea of uh, family relationships with one another, so there's storge. And then there's a word called eros, which is uh, it's the, the, the love between a man and a woman in a physical nature and stuff. And so we, we, they, they were trying to, during this love and marriage show, define what love is. What they missed out on, though, was the biblical idea of what love is, and we find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's one that they couldn't have grasped, understood, even in the fun of a game, even on the love boat, as some people said that we were on. They, they cannot define this word. It's called agape, which is much greater than, than family love or, or, or emotional romantic love or, or friendship love. It is the kind of love that only God has. So if you turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians 13, let me read to you what is often referred to as the love chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. When you find that in honor of the Lord and his word, uh, stand with us as well if we could. I'm going to squeeze right between here and all. Um, Y'all are like my background Bible readers today. And so um, the context is chapter 13, chapter 12 came before then. Chapter 12, he's talking about spiritual gifts and, and how they were misusing those. And this was a messy church. They, they, they just had a lot of mess and problems. 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, 
And though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely. Love does not seek its own. Love is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Verse 7, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. And whether there are tongues, they will cease. And whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect comes, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. Verse 13. And now abide. Faith. Hope. Love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. Father, thank you for your word. May you speak to us this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and be seated this morning. Guys, I'm going to ask that y'all's microphone is on for just a second. As your microphone is on, I do have a, a one question for you, and we'll start over here with the, uh, the youngest couple um, with, well, maybe not, uh, wherever you are in the line of things. We're going to start on, on this side. Um, and so my question for you this morning is a real simple question is this. Was there something that stood out to you guys or that you were reminded of during the uh, marriage conference that has been meaningful to you as a couple? All right. Yeah, uh, for me, uh, last, uh, the last year's cruise, uh, on day one, the Lord just spoke to us and said, you know, uh, it, it was on communication. And uh, uh, basically just uh, the Lord just started convicting us that, you know that we we needed to you know, one way to draw closer uh, to him was for us as a couple and for us to build our relationship was to uh, pray together and we started doing that and uh, we've done that ever since and and that's been great definitely you know uh, drew us closer together uh, now this year I think uh, you know I think the Lord's just picking on me because it's like, like, hey, I know you're quiet. I know you, you're you're kind of shy, but but you got to talk. You know, it's we still on communication, and uh, I it just spoke to me in a way that that uh, was that whenever uh, I'm dealing with something or we have a problem together, uh, my first thought is is that you know. I, I can deal with this on my own and get over it real quick, where if I bring it to her, then, uh, you know, she's going to hold on to it, you know. Well, I, I thought, you know, that's just the manly way. But uh, God really spoke to me in a way that says, you know, it, that may be the manly way, but it's not the godly way, that relationships rely on communication. I think if I had to wrap up the cruise in one word, for me it was unexpected um, in a lot of ways. We prayed for a long time about the cruise. We prayed for each couple individually, and we prayed that God would work. And um, I was, it caught me off guard when he started working on me <laughs> when, during Bible study. And um, I, th I think... Um, he, it says in, in one of the songs that we sang, he brings light to the darkness. And I've always thought when I've sang that lyric before that that's about terrible, evil sins, you know. And I, <laughs> when we were singing it that day, I realized he was bringing light to the darkness of just small places that we needed to work on in our marriage that left unattended can turn into big things. And so my prayers were being answered even though it was in uncomfortable ways. Okay, amen. Now, now so, so y'all were there last year, all right? Now, now these two couples, this, they're, they're first-timers, all right? Now, for some of you, it was your first time ever on a cruise boat. True? Y'all been before, or y'all, first time ever for y'all. How about y'all? Second. Second time. All right, and so, um, so some folks up here may have gone uh, reluctantly 
at first. And so we might as well turn our attention to them real quick. What, what are y'all's thoughts about the... <laughs> so what, what, what did y'all think about, you know, was there anything that the Lord reminded you of or, or, or kind of spoke to you during that, that whole cruise time? So I think for us, uh, you know, Manny and I, we've actually been doing marriage retreats for uh, annually for uh, about eight years now. And so um, we kind of knew what to expect in that portion of it. And, and um, I, I really think that um, some of the highlights for, for, for me was uh, one thing, me and Mandy, we often have a hard time getting away and like just leaving everything behind. Uh, kids, ministry, our jobs. And so it was really a time for us to get away uh, for an extended period of time and really just focus on each other. Um, typically, our marriage retreats that we go on are, are three days. Um, so this was a, an extended, uh, almost twice the time uh, that we normally go on. So it was really a time for us to just focus on each other um, and it, it just allow us to kind of forget about everything that was back on land, and um, which is often very hard for us to do. And I think for myself, um, really one of the highlights of the week was, wasn't was even uh, within our marriage, but to watch God work um, in others' marriages while we were there. Um, you know, uh, specifically uh, the Keene family. I, I mean, it was just, um, it was just really special to watch God work in, uh, in them and uh, allowed me one day to just pray over them and, and, you know, just to see the spirit just working in them. And um, just know that that wasn't a one day prayer. I, I continue to pray for you guys daily and, and, um, and not just them, but everybody on the cruise. It was just great to see um, God just pull those marriages closer together. And not only as individuals, as couples, but us as, as a whole, as a group. Um, so that, that was a highlight for me. Amen. Um, well, I guess the first thing I learned was actually before the mayor, before the cruise, it is possible to get a country boy out of the woods and the swamp and on the open seas <laughs> for a couple of days. Um, so that happened before then. If a lot of people pray, enough of them pray, the Lord moves in mysterious ways. Um, and he actually enjoyed himself. So that was great. Um, and I would just echo what Michael said, just watching everybody else, you know, the Lord moving everybody else. And, and not that he didn't move in our marriage, you know, because he did actually. But um, the highlight for me was seeing how close he brought others, you know, like Michael and I have been doing this for eight years. And we, we've kind of learned the communication key. We've learned a lot of the stuff that um, – makes you tick as a couple you know I think the one thing that we would take away from it is like that song firm foundation you know we're firm in our foundation individually I think we could be a little bit firmer together as a couple you know um like Kim said praying together and stuff like that I think that's something that I took away Amen. Amen. all right what about y'all what, what were your thoughts um was the Lord going to use this week for you? Yeah, so uh, one theme that really stuck out to me that I kept, I just kept driving is uh, this concept of, of weaving together and, and oneness. And so, um, you know, God took the rib out of Adam and created a suitable um, partner for him, and they were, they were together as one. They were one flesh. And so that that idea, that concept of being oneness um, isn't just a, okay, you're married, you're one flesh. It, it's, a, it's a constant everyday battle and, and an everyday um, choice you have to make to, to weave my life into her, to, to openly share my stuff with, with her, for her to do the same thing, but then also to bring God in the middle of that and, and equally weave um, our relationship with Christ and our relationship as a, a married couple and, and Christ all three together um, evenly. And, and when that is done right, when that's done 
every day. You're, you're reading together. You're, you're, you're praying together. You're, you're waking up, going to church together. It's not one-sided like, oh, the wife's like, all right, set the alarms and make sure the kids are all dressed and then the dragging the husband out of the bed every morning to get to church. You know, it's like, it's, it's that evenness and, and um, myself as, as a husband, as a leader of my household, making sure that we're weaving together and that the, the kids are also being woven in at, at the same time. And just that, that theme of oneness really just was driven home. And, and it's not a new concept. It's, it's something that we've learned for, we've been together 15 years now. So it, it's definitely something we've learned to do better and better through the years, but it's not something that we have to stop doing. It's, it's something that every day we're making a choice to, to continually do that together. Okay. So, um, so we are, we are looking at doing that next year again. You were a little hesitant because you're always on the water, so that doesn't seem like a lot of fun, you know. For us, sunrises on the ocean, you know, or dull for like woo woo for you. It's like eh, eh, I say it all the time. Um, would you though, for guys, you know, who may be like, well, is it touchy feely? Are we gonna be like, you know, do I gotta, you know, just puke out my feelings the whole time? W- would you recommend for for guys that are like manly men and stuff, you know, what, would it, was it still worth it even though it was in the middle of that whole thing. Yeah, I think that um, the puking out of your feelings isn't a, a, a concern. It's the seasickness part. Yeah. Um, yeah. That you, that yeah where's me, Heidi at? That um, made me want to puke. But um, no, I, I think the engagement of sharing anything like that is is really on your level how you want to 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 share. I, there's no point where you feel obligated to. Um, puke out your feelings, yeah. as you put it. <laughs> well, so, uh, so I wanted to save some of the best for last. And so, Carla, would you mind sharing some of your, your thoughts as well? Um, so if you know a bit of our story, um, God took a very broken thing um, with us from the very beginning, and, and he redeemed it. And um, so I think for us, for me personally um, on this cruise, um, I feel like we've known the Lord, you know, from youth, from a young age. Um, and I think you know, we strive daily to be very intentional about our quiet time and our prayer time with the Lord individually. Um, but I feel like on this on this trip, God really like convicted me um, about being more prayerful together um, and having that oneness um, and just you know covering our family and and so I feel we're pretty good about doing that individually, but um, just doing that together is super important. And then, you know, being uh, busy parents of five kids, it's really hard um, to, to put that time away for just each other, uh, especially trips. I mean, I think we're pretty good about taking a couple hours after bedtime. Um, so this was just really recharging for us um, and just, just remembering like, um, date each other, you know, spend time together. You know, if, if you have a busy family like us, it doesn't have to be, you know, a six day cruise, you know, a few hours after bedtime, uh, burgers, at a local joint, um, you know, and just remembering to just prioritize your marriage first and then your family. Amen. So, Amen. Would y'all give yeah, them a huge yeah. hand? Amen. Thank you so much for that. So as we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, what you'll begin to notice is is that that whole chapter um, is often called the love chapter. And the reason why it's called the love chapter is because it says love is patient, love is kind, does not envy, does not boast, is not proud, is not rude, is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. So it talks about love the entire chapter 13. But you have to remember when you're studying the, the word of the Lord that context is key. And so as you're studying, uh, as you're looking at... Um, Point them out, Mandy. Uh, just point them out. She's got you. All right. That is what we learned during the uh, the marriage conference as well, is to uh, to follow great directions and all. And so um, so we appreciate. Thank you guys for that. But as you turn to First uh, Corinthians, what we begin to realize is this: is that as we look at this whole idea of 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 love, and that's that whole chapter. Context is key because it's actually not. Though I've read it at multiple marriages and, and weddings, the context of chapter thirteen is really not just about like marriage. Well. As a husband, I need to be patient and kind and loving and all those kind of things. That's not the context. Remember, this year was a, a, messed, up, a messed up church. 
They were a church that, that went through stuff. They, they had divisions, they had sexual immorality. They were taking the gifts that the Lord gave them and beginning to just take those gifts and, and abuse the gifts that God had given to them. So this year was a, a messed up church. And by the time we get to, to chapter 13, uh, they've already talked about marriage and singleness and divorce. They've already talked about all of these issues that you and I face. And then in chapter 13, it shows us the, the most excellent way that it says, look, love is, is not only essential, eternal, but chapter 13 points out that, look, love, love is truly everything. Whatever mess that you find yourself in, whatever heartache that you're going through, no matter what the, the tension of the moment might be, no matter what it comes to, who you're with, who you're not with, who you have, who you don't have, no matter all the different things that are, are circulating your life, that the key of what he says here, he says, look, love is essential. Why? God is blank. What? Love. That's what he said. That's not what I said. That's not what we think. God is love. Well, how did God express that love to us? For God so, what? Loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And then he says, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples by the, the love that you have for one another. In fact, the first of the list of things that he says that when it comes to the fruits of the Spirit, which is when you give your life to Christ, the fruit of the Spirit, one of the first ones that he mentions is the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all that. But it starts with, with love. Love as a believer in Christ is foundational. It, it is everything. And the problem is that this church, these families, these individuals have left the love that God had been speaking of. Now, now they knew how to love physically. That's what they called love. They knew how to have friendships because they, they would meet together, and sometimes they wouldn't meet together. They understood that. But what they didn't understand is this agape love. In, in fact, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. He says at the end of verse 1, If I have not love, I've just become a sounding brass, a, a clanging cymbal. Verse 2, he says, look, if I have not love, I am absolutely nothing. Verse 3 says that, that if I have not love, it actually it profits me nothing. That's what he begins to talk about love. That he says, look, if you don't have love, you are nothing. You have nothing, and it profits you nothing at all. Let me describe what I'm talking about. On this ship, and this won't be great advertisement for you, but we were going out of breakfast. We were going to, to leave the boat for a moment, and as we went out of breakfast, suddenly we noticed that on all of the glassware, and they even put a napkin, and they make sure the napkin is in your lap. And, and out of all those things that were there, the, 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 the beauty of the place, the ornamentation of the dining room, everything stayed the same. But the one thing that changed while we were leaving breakfast one morning is that out of this ship that had about, uh, I think there was 900 and something crew members and 2,000 plus folks that were on the cruise, out of all those people that were there and out of all the clanging lights and everything that was going on, we lost power. We were docked, and so the boat still floated. Uh, it was still fine. People were getting on and off of the boat. They did not get on and off the elevator because the power was out. The lights that were in the dining room suddenly just, just came down, and, and some of the... Uh, Look, the casino lost power, so you know that it was, a, it was a monumental moment. And so here we are, there's folks running around fixing things. But, but what happened was, on the outside, if you were outside the boat, you wouldn't have realized that was what happened. The boat still looked the same. You still had the, the lifeboats where they were. You still had the different levels, the balconies. Everything looked the same. The ornamentation inside was the same. The, the pictures and everything on the wall were still the same. But the difference was, is that internally it had lost power, and without the power it could not form, function, and act like it was supposed to because it lacked the power enabling it to do so. There are a lot of Sunday Christians who look like Christians. They go to church. They, 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 they bow their head before they pray. They make sure that, you know what, well, I'm going a, I'm to a give and I'm going to put some money in the box or I'm going to do it online, however. You know, they outwardly look real Christian-y. 
Oh, they, they smile and they say, how's your mama and them? And, and you know, later on, they'll, they'll, they'll just, you know, when you walk out, you won't shove anybody because they're in your way. You ain't honking outside. You'll wait until you get to Walmart or wherever you start, you know, just hand waving signals to folks who are getting on your nerves. But, you know, you don't do it at church because that ain't how we act. So outwardly, folks have that look. But the problem is that inwardly, there's something that is missing. There's something that is not powering that Christian life. Folks know you go to church, but they don't know your love. They know that you act a certain way on Sundays, but they don't know about this love that says, I will love you in the middle of your mess. I will love you in the middle of your heartache. I will love you that will go beyond division and, and heartache and immorality. I will, I will love you because that is what is fueling my life. You see, here in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, he says, look, the problem is, is that you, 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 are, you have everything on the outside. You'd even be willing to die, have your body burn, but without love, it's not going to do you any good. Why? Because love is that relationship, love is that thing that, that binds us to the Lord when we experience the love of Christ in our own life, then what else can we do but share that love with others? These guys looked the part on the outside, but there was no internal difference that was made. And Paul here says, look, the problem is, is that you have a lack of love. I have met people who are not Christians who is much more nicer than Christians. I, I have met some folks who, you know what, man, they, they, they have no clue who God is, and yet for some reason, they can just be some good people. And then Christians with this pruned, soured up face who always have their arms crossed, they're always judgmental on somebody else. I'm like, what has God done in your life? Why are you so mad, sad, and upset? What is wrong with you? Why is it that the Bible says that a Christian is one who is overwhelmed, overflowing with love. That's what he says. He says, if you ain't got love, you are nothing, you have nothing, and you don't even profit you anything. Love is the, the, the foundation. It is the anchor. It is the motivation of a Christian's life. And Paul here says, look, if you ain't got love, you ain't got, you ain't got, got nothing. But, but what is love? Well, thankfully, he gives us the definition. Love is what verse 4 follows. Love is a hard and difficult thing if you really understand what agape love. It's easy to love your friends. That's phileo. It is easy to be romantic and, 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 and put your arm around your boo-boo and say, ooh, ooh, I love you. That's eros. It's easy to be in the middle of a family at times where everyone's getting along and you love one another. That's storge. But, but a love that brings you out of your comfort zone a love that is sacrificial and unconditional, which is what agape love is. For God so loved the world as God so agape, that, that is much greater than just friendship. It's much greater than it's sacrificial. So what is, what is love, the action verb of it? Well, look at what it says there in verse 4. Verse 4, starting all the way to verse 8, it says, this is what love is. Tony got off the boat. They had these dogs that began to sniffy, sniffy. Because when you got off the boat in Mexico, they wanted to make sure that whatever you was bringing from somewhere else, you wasn't bringing it in there. Now, uh, so, so, so what that was, was that, that little, little, little drug dog looked like, I don't, like a Benji looking dog. It wasn't, a, you know, it wasn't even like, you know, it wasn't even a, you know, like a German shepherd kind. You know, it wasn't even like, rrr, rrr. it's like, you know, what kind of mutt dog y'all got smelling for drugs around here? Like, you know, it's like the make a wish version of, uh, of this dog. And so, but, but all of a sudden, Tony didn't quite understand. She didn't quite understand what to do. And so she had her backpack, and there's this dog, and there's this man with a, a gun in his side, and she's nervous because she's about to go by there to this thing. And so she's like, what do I do? And so she grabs the thing, and she's holding it, and he's like, no, man, that's not how you do it. And so she's like, well, I don't know what to do. And so suddenly he's like, put the bag by your side, walk by the dog, the dog will sniff the bag, and if he lets you go without barking at you, just keep on walking. And so finally, she passed the test. There were no drugs. You could bring and get drugs while you was in Mexico. I mean, you know, whatever kind you want. I think they had um, uh, Percocets for $30 a bottle and stuff. You could grab them all day long, but, you know, don't, don't bring any of that kind of stuff back, you know, out of the ship. And so all of a sudden, she grabbed it. She wasn't arrested, thankfully, and she made it in, into Mexico. If there is a test 
that you want to have for your life is this love. Does it smell like love? Does it act like love? Does it look like love? What is that test that passes? For example, let's see, we got some teenage girls here. Can I, can I look at you real quick? Boys are liars. <laughs> Not elementary school boys. But all the boys that are about to get like three hairs on their chin that they comb and try to make it something, they all liars, okay? You, what, what are you talking about? I'll tell you why. I'll tell you, oh, all right, Daniel, I'll tell you why. The reason why is, is because those boys, they start getting a little pitter-patter in their little heart, and then they start falling in love with a girl. And what they say is, they'll say anything to make sure that that girl will try to kiss their face, Daniel, I'm promising you that. I know, put your head down on that one. It is. So if some boy comes up to you and he says, you know what, with his three little hairs and combs and he like puts them on and he goes, whatever, when they come to you, like, well, he said he loves me. Well, what does love look like? What is love? You know, it, you know listen, I don't want it to hurt you, all right? And so what, what is love? Well, well, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting verse 4, it gives us the definition. This is what love is. Ladies, if your husband says that he loves you, this is the smell test. To see if it's true. Men, if your wife says, look, I, I, I love you beyond anybody else. Well, this is the smell test. This is to understand if, if it's true or not. Well, what does it say? The Bible says, look, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting verse 4. Love suffers long. <laughs> Anybody been married and understand what that means? Oh, that was a trick question. All right, don't, don't say that out loud. But let's face it. There's another word. Men, if, if suffers long, doesn't make sense to you. Listen, this smell test to figure out if it's true or not of you. Love is patient. Don't look at me all sideways. That's what the Bible says. That if you say you love someone, that you are patient. I'm not just talking about the folks in your house. I'm talking about that person who's at your job. I'm talking about your kids don't always act the way that you know. Love is patient. It, Patient, a great word, is like the King James, the New King James says it, love suffers long. It is willing to, in the middle of immorality, division, in this mess of this church, it's willing to say, you know what, I, I am going to be patient with what God is doing in your life. Love is patient. That's a smell test. Love is patient. Love is kind. What, what does the Bible say there? It says that love is, is kind. Man, if the Lord listened to all the words that you said out of your mouth, to your precious spouse, to your kids, I have a feeling that some of us would be ashamed of ourselves if God heard every word that came out of our mouth. Can I clue you in on something? God hears every word that comes out of your mouth. Love is patient, but it's also kind in the way that it treats another person. Some of us treat our dog better than we treat people in our own lives. Boy, let me pet them. Let me get them. Come on, you want to sit up on my lap and stuff. You know, we were so excited. Uh, you know, some of these folks who ain't seen their dog, their cat, and all of a sudden that dog or cat pounces on them, just going to lay down and say, I love you. And we're so kind and gentle. We'll make sure that we feed them the best little Alpo brand that we can find. And, and then that person that's in our house that we say we've committed our life to and we love them, our children, we treat them with the most harshest of words, treat them like dogs, just treat them like the lowest of low, and we act like we can get away with that. And the Bible says that's not love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love, love does not. You see, it's not just about what love is, but it's also about what love is not. Because if you read the verse, verse 4, it says, look, let me tell you, love is not just patient, it's not just kind, but it does not. What is it does not? It does not parade itself, which means it does not, uh, it does not envy, it does not parade itself, it's not proud, it's not puffed up, does not seek, uh, behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil. Verse 6 says, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Verse 7, bears all things, believes all things, hopes hopes all things, endures all things. Verse 8 says, love never fails. Now listen, any engaged couples, I don't think we have anybody engaged here today. Some of y'all watching online are and stuff, but if you're, if you're engaged to someone, if you know you got a grandchild who's engaged, this is the litmus test. This is what you ought to tell them, well, honey, how do they treat you? Well, sometimes, you know, he, he's a little impatient, and sometimes he, he, he kind of says some things that kind of hurt my feelings and all. Well, well, honey, if that's the man that you want to marry, then you may want to reconsider that because love is patient. 
Well, well that, he just grew up that way, and he doesn't really mean anything. No, no, love is patient. You, you tell somebody that you love them, then that is a, a, a part of, of loving somebody. You say, well, well, you don't understand what my life has been like, and it's hard for me at times to be kind. I don't mean nothing by the words that I say. Well, stop saying stupid words. Love is patient, it is kind, it, it does not envy, it's not boastful, it's not proud, it's not all about me and my wants and desires. That not only works in marriages, it works in families, it works in, in relationships with people at your job to where you put up with stuff in a different way. Why? Because it's simply love as a Christian, as a person who knows Christ, you can't help but act any other way besides this smell test of what it is. And you may say to yourself, well, well, that, that's, that's hard to do all the time. God so loved the world that it was hard to do all the time. And he's willing to literally give his life because it's hard to do all the time. Love is not a feeling, though it has feelings. Love is not just an emotion, though it, it, it stirs up emotions. Love is not just something that, that you know, that this, this, boy, I, I, I get that. And it's, it's, no, that love, is, love is sacrifice. Love is obedience. Love is doing the right thing even when you want to do the wrong thing because you know the right thing is always the act of love. Love is doing hard stuff. Love is doing sacrificial stuff. That's what he's talking about here where he says, look, love. We see these couples here and, and you know, we're excited that, that we say, oh, man, they, they love each other. And I can see that love and they're growing in that love. But well, this chapter doesn't just apply to love between a husband and wife. It's much greater than that. It's about who we are as believers in Christ, that, that whole idea that love shall never fail. And he goes on in verse, verse 9 where he defines what love is, and I, I hope that you see what love is and what love is not. But then he goes in verse 9 to say this, We know in part, we prophesy in part, when that which is perfect has come, then that which is perfect will, will be done away with. Now, now in seminary, Brother Drake, they'll, they'll, they'll say, well, some people will say this, that, that whole idea of, of that part that's done away with, that they'll say, well, when, when the Bible was put together, then that got rid of some of those gifts like tongues and everything else, and so that was put away with. So some people say that's the, what it means by when the, the perfect has come. But if you look there, it says, then we shall see, verse 12, uh, face to face is what verse 12 says. I know in part, then I shall know just as I also am known. So it kind of makes it hard for me to understand why would that mean the Bible. I think when we're talking about the perfect that is coming is Jesus Christ, who we will one day see face to face. And when we see Christ face to face, then that way we will know what it means for love, verse 13. To have faith, hope, and love abide, but the greatest of these is love. I'll share it to you this way. Let me, let me just kind of uh, put all these things together. When you go on a cruise, you don't ever make your bed. Oh, that's nice. Really nice. And you'll go, and, and you know what? You step out the door, look outside, and before you know it, like five minutes later, they done made your bed, put a little pillow, or like, you know, a little, little animal figure with one eye or two eyes or whatever. They'll put it on your bed. They done vacuumed your floor. You know, they done cleaned up all your mess in the bathroom. And, and you know, you leave for a minute, and then all of a sudden they come back, and it's like, phew, it's, it's done. You got trash. And son-in-law and I were trying to figure out, you know, where do we put our trash? And it's like, I guess I just put it on the table and like, you know, it just disappears magically. Wives, you ever, husbands ever do that before? You know, it's like, you know, they put their, 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 their dishes in the sink and then just magically disappears. And I don't know who does that, but it's like, well, the servant of my house does that. Well, no, that's your, that's your spouse. But all of a sudden you do that and they, they pick your trash up and and, you know, they're, they're taking care of you. They, they come and, and, you know, uh, Sarah, would you like something else? You know, they just kind of come around you and stuff. That's my best uh, Filipino impression and stuff. And so they're, they're just like, you know, they're always tending to you. You know, they're like, would you like another piece of bread? You know, with your two entrees and your two desserts and your, your, your two appetizers that you get, Mr. Rosa, would you like anything more? I'm like, would I like anything more? In fact, I would. Let me get a cheese plate and some bread and stuff. You know, it takes, you know, I mean, they're just there to, to, to be there to, to, to serve you. You and, and they, they do everything that they can to, 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 to make sure you're taken care of. But there's the little price in this all-inclusive thing. You see, these folks aren't doing it for free. Did you notice that? They, they're not actually doing it for free. Um, what they are doing is, is that they're just doing their job, and they believe that their job is to take care of you. And, and they figured out, hey, look, I, I'm doing this because of the price that you've already paid. They serve you 
because of the price that was already paid. They take care of everything because of the price that was already paid. They, they make sure that your needs are taken care of. Why? Because of the price that was already paid. It's, it's all, where's Heidi at? Uh, it's all inclusive, Heidi. It's all, all inclusive. All of that is just, just included. But there's, yeah, there's still a cost. It's a lingering cost that happens. Here the Bible says that one day we shall see face to face. We will know as we are already known. We Right now we see through a mirror dimly, but one day we will see just as plain as day. See who? See what? Realize what at that point in time. Everything they did, they did at a price. And when the price was paid by you, then they were able to do everything that they did. Everything that God has done in your life was at a price. But it was not a price that you could pay. It was not a price that you could ever earn enough in order to get it and receive it. There was not a price that you could say, I am valuable enough. I, 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 I've done enough things to earn the opportunity for God's grace and mercy and blessings to pour out on my life for him to, to give me all of his grace and mercy for God to take care of me in that way. All of those things, there was a price that was paid, but you could never pay that price, all inclusive of every part of your life, not only for here on this earth, but for eternity to come. He paid a price, was willing to all inclusive give you everything, but why would God do that for you? Why would God be willing to pay the sacrifice for you? You who don't deserve it, who have more mess and trash in your life, why would God clean that up? Why would God make things right? Why would God put things in order in your life when you don't deserve it, you can't earn it, you can't pay for it, you could never get it on your own? Why would God do that? What is the motivation? What is the heartbeat? What is the thing that God, why would God do that? It was only because of love. Love brought sacrifice. Love was willing to do the hard thing. Love was willing to reach down from eternity to reach down to your humanity and find you in the middle of your mess. Why? So that he could pay the ultimate price for you to be included in the family of God, for him to do all the work, and then for you to receive the free gift of God through Jesus Christ. Hernandez, is y'all became famous on that cruise. Folks were like, hey, is that, is that Jimmy? That's Jimmy right there. Hey, hey is that, that was Miss Jane right there. Y'all see Miss Jane? She, she was sliding, listen, she was sliding down the next day on this green slide where you had to stand there. They closed the tunnel. They counted to three, and all of a sudden, you dropped down like, you know, I don't know, three seconds, four seconds, and you were at the bottom. Some of these men folk, that went on this cruise, that was just like, I'm a man. I can do everything my wife wants me to do. Them boys would not go those six flights of stairs up to that thing and shoot themselves down that thing. Miss Jane, you showed them boys what to do. Well, he was proud of you. And all of you men who wouldn't go down that slide, Miss Jane will, will help you realize what that means to be a man. More check with her. Now, here's the thing. They were known for this little moment. She thought, well, if I win this thing, I'm going to get a free, free cruise. Lisa. She thought, I'm going to get a free cruise, right? And all that she received was a free cruise ship on a stick. Little <laughs> circle. That's all she got out of that bad boy. A free cruise ship on a stick. Listen, when you understand God's love, you may be thinking to yourself, well, well, what do I receive out of this thing? God's grace, mercy, kindness, blessing, absolutely. But you know what you receive most of all? He gave you his love so that you could actually give that love away. And before you amen that, 
Realize what does that mean? It means that you have to do hard stuff, sacrificial stuff, that, that you have to be willing to, to meet people where they are. Why? Because you're going to show love to that person who is so undeserving, who could never earn it, and you do just like God did to you. You give that love away. That you actually are able to find folks in the middle of their heartache and, and pain and everything else, and that you're willing to give that. Why? Faith, hope, and love abide. But the greatest of these is love. The greatest gift ever given was love. The thing that God motivated the factor to get out of, of heaven's glory to down to this earth was, was love. Listen, you may be in the house right now with people in your life, and you're like, they are the most unloving, the most unkind. They are not patient. They are not good to me. Uh, they, they, they don't deserve anything for me to do in their life. And what does God say? Love even that person. But they don't deserve it. They, they haven't earned it. They haven't done anything. To, no, that's not what love is. Love does not wait. Love does not uh, just measure up. Love does not say, well, it's, a, it's an equal game. When they love me, then I'm going to love them. That's not how love works. Love, and that's why this chapter isn't just a love chapter. This is a sacrifice chapter. This is a hard chapter. This is one that says, no, I'm willing to love like God loved with every part of me. Here's, here's how we'll close. What the world needs now is love. Why? Because love is everything. What your family needs now is love. Why? Because love is everything. What you need now is love because love is everything. There are some overachievers in our group. They got home yesterday. As soon as they got home, they took their luggage, they opened it up, and they actually unpacked their luggage. Not only did they unpack it, they had a laundry suitcase of stuff that was ready to be put into the laundry. They done washed it, dried it, folded it, and put it away. Then there's folks who said, you know what? I'm going to cook gumbo, potato salad. I'm going to make a roast for later on. And they, they were there in their house already done cooked everything for the week to come. But what happened? They brought baggage home with them. And they said, I, I got to get rid of this baggage because if I don't, I'm going to trip over it. I can't start my week until I put away those things that need to be put up, put things in place that need to be put into place, and get rid of these bags that I've been carrying because I need to be free to be able to do what I need to do. And so some of y'all came in this morning. You're like, man, this is, this is a hard week. Because I meet some unlovely people. In my family, we, we needed to be on a marriage cruise. Because the way we treat one another in our household, the way things have been going in our marriage, we are one step away of, of just losing everything because it's, it's in a hard place. My kids and I and the relationship that I have with them and, and how separated we are, there's no love there. I haven't talked to them in years, and I just feel this lack and distance between me and that family member or, or, or me and God. We don't even get along, and I just feel like there's, there's no, no love. And when I get on Facebook and, and I begin to read comments and people coming at me and I'm coming back at them, and there's just no, no, no love and the Lord says, God is love, for God so loved the world that he did something about that, because love is always an action. He gave, and because he gave, then he gave that to me so that I could then give it to, to others. Have you got some baggage today? Maybe it's sin, unforgiveness, hatred that you've harbored with someone else. Maybe today the real situation and circumstance is that there's just a lack of love in your family. It doesn't pass the smell test. Well, friends, the only way to take care of that is allow God's love to unpack every part of that, put things in place, put them in order, and then you say, Lord, take all my baggage. I can't do this on my own. You can't do anything on your own. You need a Savior and his name is Jesus Christ. Let's come to him today. Would you bow your head for just a moment? As our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And, and I wonder this morning, friend, is there, is there something that you need to get right between you and the Lord? Is there something that you need to say, I, I do not love them. I am not experiencing the love of Christ in my life or in our family. 
I do not want to love that person who's been so unloving towards me. I'm, I don't want to do any of that. Well, friends, until you understand the love of God, you can't understand how to love someone else. And maybe today the bigger problem is not them, it's you and Jesus. Maybe this morning is a time that you need to just come to this altar and lift that person up and pray for him. Maybe this morning is a time for you to just pray for your own self and say, God, give me a heart like Jesus. Help me to love the unlovely. Help me to love those that don't deserve it. Help me to have a heart like the Lord that just gives it all back to him. This morning is your invitation to do that. The altar will be open. We'll be here to pray with you. But maybe this morning it's just you and the Lord that needs to get some things right. And so, Father, I pray this morning that there's somebody who's never given their life to Christ who are here in the sanctuary, they're at home, that, God, maybe, maybe this morning you'd soften a hardened heart, a heart that has had no power and love on the outside. It looks so Christian-y, but on the inside there's no love ever. That, God, this morning you'd fill them with the love of Christ to overflowing. This morning you'd help them to remove the baggage that's cluttered their life and suddenly just be able to experience the grace and mercy of God and then give that grace and mercy to way to others. Lord, we love you for this day. We thank you for your blessing. We pray that you'd restore marriages, restore families, but most of all, for that person who doesn't know Christ, that you'd restore their soul. And this morning, they give it all to Jesus Christ. So Lord, we love you. We thank you for this time. Pray your blessing upon this invitation. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Stand with us for this morning, if you would. We'll be at the front. If you need to make a decision for Christ, we invite you to do that as we sing together this morning. Amen. Are you hurting, broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for drink from the well? Jesus is calling. What do we need to do? Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Come on. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Savior Isn't He wonderful Sing hallelujah Christ is risen Bow down before Him For He Oh 
moment, Bryce, I'm going to ask that you uh, take our online feed and just kind of say goodbye to them. Those of you watching online, thanks for joining us. Just want to take a moment, though, to um, give me a